wrong, wrong. <laughs> Wait a minute. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> nice. Nice. I have to bring all my children. <laughs> so this is Joe Tripodi. From <laughs> from Guess where? Who do you work for yeah, again? There you go. <laughs> and this is um, Jess Frampton. Um, thank you both for being in and thanks everyone for being here. And I, I would read your bio, but I had to turn my Blackberry off so it didn't disturb everybody. But you're C CEO of uh, Interbrand, um, oh, big, consult big consulting company. And I've, I've got your bio here, um, 25 years in marketing. Um, when I, I'm, I'm foreign, as you can probably hear from my voice, I wasn't born in Brooklyn. So when I, when I think of um, Coke, and particularly this particular red color, I know this bottle's new, I, th I think of sort of, I think of America. I, th I think of um, freedom and great stuff you can buy and consume and, you know, sort of great, great movies and great adverts I watched growing up, usually for Levi's and stuff. What do you think of when, you, when you're marketing Coke around the world? $71 billion in value that Jez talked about today. <laughs> <laughs> Creating a lot of economic value all around. Uh, it's quite a big business. Uh, I would say, you know, what, the reason that Coke has been has survived for, and this is our 125th anniversary as a company, the reason we survive is the ability to stay relevant and particularly culturally relevant. And, you know, not as it... We always think about it as managing both the intrinsic sides and the extrinsic side. And on the intrinsic side, great tasting product, goes down smoothly, no real, uh, no real memory uh, with respect to the taste so that you can drink as much as you need, gives you an uplift. But it's the extrinsic side around that little, you know, what we've tried to build around the essence of the brand around optimism, positivity, happiness. That's where we are trying, and that's what we do with our open happiness campaign. That's where we're going, Simon. And an Americanness, is that in there? Not necessarily Americanness. Some people interpret it that way, but our, our long term success will be if Coke is Chinese in China. Okay, and I want to get to the Chinese qu question sure. because um, your boss um, basically is saying that China is friendlier to businesses than the U.S. is, and that the U.S. needs to clean did he up. Did say that? Yeah, he, he, did, he, did, he did say that. I have it, I have it here <laughs> written down. Um, got my source code. So he, he's saying that, and um, that, that may be true, but the U.S. also has some values with regard to um, human rights and working conditions. Mm -hmm. um, you said that, you know, that this isn't associated with Americanness, and yet for a lot of people it is. It's to do with freedom and decency. I would say we're not overtly pushing that. I think that people will interpret it in the way they want to interpret okay. it. If that's their little, if for an American overseas or an American traveling in Africa, and they go into a remote village mm. and find a Coca-Cola, that's their little touch of Americana. For other people, they may see it as a symbol of freedom or American values. Okay. For others, they may just see it as a refreshing beverage. We are not overtly pushing America when we market this product around the world, okay. I can tell you that. And is, I, is that. is that the right way to go? Well, I, I'd agree with Joe completely. I think it's, we call the list I'm that thirsty. we create every year the best global brands, and Coca-Cola is at the top of that, uh, because I think it is genuinely a global brand. Hmm. I think when you've got it right, um, I mean, I grew up in the UK, and we all thought that Ford was a British company. Um, I think in the I think same... It isn't? Apparently not. Apparently. I think it's owned Shocking. by the Americans, or so, so they say. Um, but you know, um, I think that when you've got it right, it doesn't really matter where you come from. I think a number of brands uh, very successfully leverage their heritage. You know, uh, companies like BMW and Audi sort of leverage their Germanness mm. along the way, particularly Audi with their end line. But it's not really doesn't really matter where you come from. It matters whether you feel at home where you are. Okay, and and the comments made by his his boss about the U.S. being uh, less friendly to business than, than China is. Does that is that a bit of a black eye? Because I could see that. I keep hearing stories out of China about working conditions and about oppression and all that sort of stuff. When the head of an iconic brand says something like that, do you think that that sort of um, brushes aside the important things that America stands for? Um, I Number one, I, I, I'm not sure of the context that this was made, so I think I'd have to be very careful to okay. comment on what somebody else was saying. Um, I think it's very easy to make statements about different markets in which you operate, and there's always reasons around why you might be saying them. Okay. I think it'd be foolish for us to comment. Ask okay. the man himself. He's a, he's a, he's a very, he's very wise, very wise, very diplomatic. It's pr probably why he's, he's so successful. Sure. So, um, num number one brand. Yeah. Uh, congratulations. You Thank must be you. very thrilled. Um, ni We're nice. We're humbled by this. Nice red, silver, black, black bottles there. Where do you go from number one? I mean, what, what, what happens next? How do you go forward? What do you do? Well, again, it's all about how you retain, retain relevance. When we, we look at our business. 
on consumption on a per capita basis. So, for example, how many eight ounces of Coca-Cola are consumed by a person per year? In the, in, uh, the global average, well, I'll t give, first I'll give you the top of it. The top of the, the tables, the league tables, would be Mexico at 400 Cokes a year. So that means everyone in Mexico is drinking at least one Coca-Cola a day. Wow. The global so average So one Coke of, of this size, which is about eight, eight ounces. ounces. Eight okay. ounces. They're measuring a serving as eight ounces. So, you know, well, the global average is only 85. So when you see the opportunity, then when we look at, you know, Coke is, beyond, Coke is also, what many of you may not know, the world's largest juice company. And so when you add in juice, water, teas, coffees, etc., in Mexico, that goes up to 675. So that means everyone in Mexico, nearly everyone in the country of Mexico is drinking almost two products of the Coca-Cola company a day. Wow. It's a huge number. But so what you'd like to do is just turn Mexico into the world. We pray for Mexico every day, <laughs> let me say that. <laughs> so, so, but I would say this, Simon. But the key is, how do you activate? But our, our per caps in China might be 30. In India, they might be two. Right. So the, uh, if we look at it as a land of opportunity primarily by three macro factors. One, massive urbanization. Mm -hmm. We think in the next 10 years, about 800 million people are going to move into cities. I can tell you personally, I lived in Hong Kong in the, in the early 1980s. 20% of China lived in the cities then. 47% of China lives in the cities now. 300 million people have gone into the cities. Is, is the urbanization important because the need totally. to refrigerate? Is that, is that what it is? Do you think that uh, these could be drunk? I mean, I would uh, yeah. Jez and I, I'm sure, drank these warm when we were kids, right? <coughs> yeah. Definitely. It's true. It's true, right? We're in Britain. <laughs> it's true. Right? Everything's the warm, even the beer. Uh, even the beer. <laughs> but, but, I mean, it, is that for you, though? Is that, I mean, obviously, you sell it in Britain without chilling it. But sure. you're saying, but basically, you like to have stuff chilled, and that's the that way. That would be the optimal serve, how we would serve and present our product, with mostly all our products. But mm -hmm. we would say the other big trend is middle class development. We think that over the next 10 years, probably almost a billion people will enter the middle class. When people get more money, and then they get and move into cities, their life changes. It gets faster. They're looking for packaged convenience and packaged beverages more. And so they convert into a ready-to-drink beverage, as opposed to not having a lot of time to squeeze the juice or boil the, you know, brew the tea. Their life changes. And, and then they get really rich, and they want to do that, um, and they want to squeeze the juice or have their butler do it. So <laughs> how do you, right, how do you, the, the, obviously, he wants the brand everywhere. He wants, you know, 400 a year Mexico style, the, the world over. How do you do that with, it, with any brand and not get it tired so that it's everywhere? I mean, when something's everywhere, it's, it, you know, it, how do you keep it fresh? Well, I, th I have to say, and I'm not blowing whatever it is up, Joe's whatever. But <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jez. But I think, you <laughs> know, to that. it's very, very easy. We, um, the fastest growing brand on our, on our league table this year was Apple. 58% increase in, in brand value. Tremendous performance. Everybody loves their products. They continuously innovate in terms of their products. And right about, iPhone right about. Just about to come out yeah, in any right, minute Yeah, right about now. now. How do they keep that sexy? Well, that's what I was part going to it, say it? was that it's easy for them because they're creating something sure. completely new every single week virtually. Joe's selling us the same thing. I mean, he'll tell you that they don't mess with the formula. They tried it once and it didn't really go too well. So they stick with what they've got and therefore the innovation has to happen around the product. That comes down to really understanding your market, understanding your brand and making sure that you execute in a way that's relevant in every market. Okay, so understand the brand. Mm -hmm but also the world changes. Absolutely. So uh, w one of the things pointed to um, by politicians in this country, notably this city, is sugary drinks sure. and the effect on children. Sure. Now, th these are sort of the size of Cokes that I would dr drink as a kid. Sure. Um, is this what's coming back? Is that the innovation to bring? And we'll get to the actual what this is made sure. of in a moment. But is, is, is going down in size a reaction to that in part? I think we, we would be focused on maximizing the choice. I think in particularly in the US, for a very long time we were just basically in three packages. A two liter straight wall bottle, which didn't reflect the contour bottle that we've, we've, uh, we've run with all over the world for a long time. A 20 ounce uh, plastic PET mm. bottle and a 12 ounce can. And I think what we wanted was to offer a lot more choice through size variants. And that's why, you know, my job, I'm not chief marketing officer, I'm chief marketing and commercial officer because you need to have that price pack architecture right in the store in order to optimize the amount of choice that consumers 
when, when consumers get into the store and make that choice and that selection. So you're certainly going to see a lot more smaller sizes simply because that's what people are calling for. That's what people if, if people want them, we need to give it to them. Okay. So pro problem for marketing consultant, how do you take down the volume and keep your pricing, pricing power? Because the, the packaging still costs a lot and, and, and it, it isn't proportionate to its size either. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, this is where brands come in. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 you know, well, the, I'm sure Joe's got a ton of research which shows that if he takes the Coca-Cola name and the, the shape of the pack off of there and you're just left with the liquid and, and you don't know where it's from, you get a very different response in terms of what mm. people are prepared to pay and what they think it stands for. So brands, if they're, if they're built properly, enable you to charge a consistent premium over time that you are chose positively because you are who you are, not because you just happen to be there. Uh, and that people will continue to choose you over time, which are the three things that we look at in our methodology. And let me, Simon, let me give you an example from a previous life when I was head of marketing for Seagram in the liquor industry. The thing that amazed me was a colorless, odorless, tasteless liquid became a global phenomenon through marketing. You're not talking about water, are you? I'm talking about absolute vodka. And people would pay a premium for that vodka. Yeah. And so that taught you, that taught me the value and the power of brand is incredible if you can burn into the consumer's mind certain images of what that represents and, that's, and what that stands for. And there's a brand that was built without traditional mass media, very different than getting on and advertising heavily on television. So it was done basically through a print campaign so, and on-premise. So let, let's talk about campaigns. Sure. Uh, the web versus TV. Clearly Coke's done very well using TV. Uh, what about the, just the web. Is the, is the web, web come of age for marketers? Is, is, is that the way he should be um, well, I'm marketing these I'm fantastic... I'm to put words in his mouth, but I mean, my, my point of view is that... You can, you know. He all, of these, all of these different things that are available to marketeers, uh, the, the point is understanding what message you're trying to get across and then understanding what might be the best possible way to do it. And I think whereas 20 years ago, the options available to people like Joe and, and other people who are trying to build brands around the world were relatively limited. Now the options are manifold. And the, the challenge, I guess, for anybody is to work out what's the best way to do it. How do I use the web? How do I use Twitter running around us right now? How do I use Facebook? How do I use traditional TV advertising? How, you know, it's about so, so understanding how it all comes together from a communication so, so perspective. One of the things about the, about the TV, it, it, it seems that there's like some knowledge of who's watching, but not a whole lot. And with the, with the web, yeah. we know who's watching, where they're watching, how old they are, what, the, what their address is, more more or less, um, and how long they've watched it, and whether they clicked off when Fonzie jumped the shark or whatever. They know that exactly at that, at that moment. And, and yet it seems that marketers are not piling headlong into the web in, in the way that you'd have thought when they suddenly are given all that information that they said they'd been craving for decades. Well, you know, when I kind of grew up in the world of marketing, there was this thing called direct mail, when they used to put things through your letterbox. Do you remember that? And the whole idea was that it was, it was uh, extremely... It made good kindling for a fire. Perfect. And it was, and it was very, very uh, measurable. Yes. So people liked it, but then they realized that it had a role to play. And that were the certain things that it was good at and th certain things that it was not so good at. I think the difference between that medium and what's going on with digital and, and the web is that the ability to build relationships with people, the ability to have conversations. And now, of course, we're starting to really see the connection of text, comment, perspective, video, all of these things coming sure. together. I mean, I think we're still at the beginning of what this really means to marketing and how it might work. And, and again, you know, Joe's in, involved in this every single day. I'm sure he has a... a yeah, I, yeah, we absolutely are at the beginning of this journey, and it's a long journey. And I think when you get into a very large global business system, it would not be wise or prudent to move all your resources onto one thing. You know, it was, it was just like the hysteria that occurred 10 or 15 years ago that you know, everybody was going to buy all their groceries through, through online and Peapod, right? And you, go, and you went to one extreme. Consumers don't change that quickly. And so you have to be very measured and lean into these new opportunities. When you have a business like ours that has been built, you know, for so many years on consistent investment, on a certain type of investment, mm -hmm. you're not going to completely abandon that, throw the baby out with the bathwater, and chase the next shiny object. It wouldn't make a lot of sense. But, but, but Having said that, you need to be leaning in. And so we think about a model at Coke that we call 70-20-10. 70% of your investment in those areas that we know drive the greatest value and are pretty 
really uh, have given us the, the payoff we want. 20% innovating off the 70%, and then 10% that we ring fence and say, let's experiment, let's try new stuff. If we fail, that's fine. Fail is a good thing. The thing, is, the thing that's the bad thing is if we fail at the same thing in 25 countries, then we haven't scaled the learning from the failure. And so it's that managing and entering that and leaning into the social media or the new media at an appropriate pace as opposed to saying, I'm changing everything now. But it is important uh, well, and, uh, to, to, that. to be media agnostic, my point, Simon, to be <laughs> media agnostic and to allocate your resources against where, where are the people, where are the consumers, where you, do you get them? You said people don't change that quickly, but when they do change, it can come very quickly and hit a company it can be very ruthless. hard. Absolutely. Like the book selling business yes. ha has been devastated very quickly. A Amazon was, was selling books, and right. then they were doing the Kindle, and, and it was really sort of a, a nothing sure. clunky, clunky device that sure. I wouldn't be seen dead with. And then suddenly, all the bookstores are out of business. Right. That's, I well, mean, that's this intermediation through technology. I'm not yet seeing that level of disintermediation in the beverage business, given you, you have can't to, re, yeah. You can't remix your own in quite, quite the same way, can you? Uh, but, but back to China, there is a, a, a growing brouhaha, yes. um, different one this time, um, over currency. Um, and uh, we, got, we got the Congress saying, you know, what, what, what should we be doing about this? China needs to get its act together. China saying, oh, you know, you do anything to us, and that will start a trade war. If it goes that far, how bad is that for you, or, or do you really, does it really matter? Well, listen, we, we have a very strong business and developing business in China. We, trade wars aren't good for anyone, so that, that's what I would say. So we hope, uh, we really hope that that doesn't go in that direction. That's mm. not, uh, uh, we, we don't think in, we, we believe in free trade flow as the most opportune way to grow the business and to grow all businesses around the world. And so. So when the barriers come down, that's good. China is a journey. China is a work in progress. Mm -hmm. it, is an, it is a great country that's evolving and changing. And you know, the, every time you go to China, you see a whole new city built on top of the old city that was there five years before. That level of development is unprecedented in world history, in my view. And what they've achieved there in China is unprecedented. But it, it's being appropriately managed by the Chinese within the context of their society. You know, I think we get very dangerous when we apply our own model of thinking into a different world. That's my opinion, hmm. not the opinion of the Coca-Cola company. Ah, <laughs> as another wise man, this is why he's had a long, a long career. Um, we're looking at a, an economic scenario that at best is bleak and, and, and at worst is much worse than that. It's, it's, it's horrendous. How do you take like a, a brand like like Coke or, or a, another mass market brand, premium, premium price maybe, and continue to succeed in times that are tough for many, many people, not just in this country, but all around the world? Um, I think uh, first and foremost, there is a lot of evidence. Uh, and of course, we rather fortunately or unfortunately had the uh, opportunity to go through a few upturns and downturns mm. over the last decade or so. And there is a ton of evidence that shows that if you continue to build your brand, and I'm not talking about communications here, because brands are built through your environments, your people, your products and services, and your communications. It's everything that you do. If you continue to innovate, continue to develop, continue to deliver to your audience, the chances are you will come out in a much better position than the people that you're competing with. So number one, our advice would be, and we take our own advice, is continue to build your brand no matter what is going on around you because it is fundamentally one of the most valuable assets you own and an extremely important point of differentiation and competitive strength. So you, you uh, abandon that at your peril. Um, I think you know, the, the, the keys to getting it right are pretty simple. Um, there's a funny thing about downturns, actually. They have a very interesting habit of, uh, shall we say, shaking out markets. Um, you can see it in the car market, probably more innovation over the last five years than we've seen in the previous 50. You know, significant changes in that industry, significant changes in many oh, other so you, industries. Your actual capitalist believes in creative destruction. This is great. Um, great well, to meet no, you. I don't, I don't, I'd much mm -hmm. rather things continue to go up, but mm -hmm. I do think that the, you, you Put, you gave me specifically a situation yeah. that things could get worse. And I think two pieces of advice. Number one, stick at it. Stick at because it. Because if you don't, the chances are somebody else is. Uh, and the second thing is do not stop innovating. Because again, people continue to change. They adapt to their new context. Slightly tougher times. Okay, you need to make sure in Joe's case that he's got the right 
pack sizes, he's got the right positioning, he's got the right Can you think right of a, any, anyone, um, and, and let's leave Coke out of this, but other companies where, where they've got complacent and they have stopped innovating and, and then basically just dropped the ball and left the goal wide open for someone to just dribble the ball up, kick it in the back of the net and, and, and score and score and score again? I don't think anybody purposefully take purpose takes their eye off the ball but I think it's quite interesting if you look at the you know the fast growers in our table this year are people like Apple Amazon Google Samsung Burberry interesting but that's another story the ones that are going down interestingly there's just as many in the in the electronic space companies like Sony Nokia Nintendo Black, now, what's Blackberry, the difference? Blackberry, no, Blackberry are doing okay, but they nearly need to sort themselves out. They're, okay. not, they're not in as much trouble as somebody like Nokia. Now, you know, in that situation, you, know, you have to ask yourself, how can these companies that appear to be competing in exactly the same markets, some people's you know, fortunes are going through the roof and, and, and others are going through the floor? Now, there's something about the, the way that those companies are operating, their degree of connection to their customer, the clarity of understanding about what role they play in their marketplace, mm -hmm. really what their brand is about, and then about delivering and executing a product, a service, environments, whatever else you need to do in order to create something that's genuinely desirable by consumers. You know, the rules don't change. It's pretty simple stuff. Make things that people desperately want and wrap it in a brand that they can't live without. Well, I, did, I did desperately want that, but he, he already started it. So, but no, I see. But I, you I, couldn't resist drinking some. I noticed. I, I, I couldn't or resist. Was that drink. just because you were thirsty? I, I was actually <laughs> thirsty at that, but but that that bottle is. So uh, this is about creating the future and seeing the future, and, and I'm told that the best way to to see the future is to create it for yourself. What are you doing to create a a, a different future, a better future? for your brands going forward? Like, what can we expect in 10 years' time, in five years' time, um, next week, I whatever, whatever it is? I think that's a great question, Simon. I think, first of all, I would say that the, op the operating environment for large global enterprises now is more complex than ever. And you remember the Jim Collins book, uh, seminal book, the, the Good to Great, and he talked a lot about the genius of the ant, how you've got to balance these two things that are inherently in, in contradiction. You know, you've got to be global, but you've got to be local. You've got to, you know, you've got, you've got, in our case, we try, we're trying to double our business in 10 years, what it took 125 years, but in a sustainable way. There's all of these inherent contradictions that we live with all the time. We have to be great storytellers, but we have to scale. We have to be going after teens, because every, no, everyone knows that's teens, that's the future. But there's huge adult populations going up around the world. We have to be great inspirational marketers, but we have to be great operational marketers. Balancing all of these countervailing, these counteracting forces is a real challenge for us. When we look out as to how we're going to reinvent and continue to reinvent our future, you know, when we think about innovation, we're just not thinking about what's in the bottle, irrespective of the five, we have 500 brands, 3,000 products, probably 12,000 SKUs. It's more about, yes, product innovation, packaging innovation, equipment innovation, which it gets to, and then all types of consumer engagement innovation. How do you get to consumers, whether it's digital, mobile, or whatever? We are looking at all of those. We fundamentally think, though, regardless of those, we have a philosophy we call liquid and linked. So regardless of what we're doing, we want to make sure that the idea, the powerful idea has to sit right there at the center. And you have to be able to, it has to be liquid and it has to be able to go to all of these different endpoints. Some so, of them be digital, some will be analog. What's the powerful idea at the center of this thing? Just to remind us. Open happiness. Open, open. Hope is a, Coca -Cola, as a Coca-Cola brand, Coca-Cola is kind of, I would say the idea is Coca-Cola is an antidote to modern day woe, at least as we stand currently. So wow. there's a little moment of happiness in your life. Wow, and, it, and it's, it's all moment. the moment. We're not solving world peace, Simon. To, to, I'm sure you're Oh, really? I thought you were going to be doing that next. We're not solving world peace. Uh, but what we are saying is that a little pause, a moment of refreshment in your everyday life. Okay. I, 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 that, that sounds, that sounds reasonable? Not unreasonable at all, however much you're <laughs> selling that for or whatever it is. One of the things that we, we know is that things, when they're produced in the marketing department, they sit on the table and the marketers will stand around and say, yes, we can produce this. And yet when you go to buy it, like when I go to buy a, a Coke, it, it's typically in one of the, the delis in the bottom of a cooler. Um, the cooler's sort of got sort of grime around it and stuff like that. And so th that's just the way, isn't that just the way things are, are produced? Is that a, how much of a problem is that for 
a company with its brand, because that's, that's the channel of distribution for a lot of products like this, for a lot of soft drinks, a lot of beers. I mean, um, I think I'll, I'll, um, I'll let Joe answer it specifically about Coke, because he's the, he's the commercial guy as well as the marketing guy. Um, but you know but, where I'm coming from, oh, that, no, exactly chan where that you're channel of distribution. Well, they, you know, the medium is the message, as they used to yeah. say, uh, and the channel is as much the message as the medium might be. So if you take somebody like Samsung, for instance, when they decided that they were going to go full on after Sony about 15, 20 years ago, um, the first thing that, uh, that they did was they looked very hard at their distribution strategy and they took a very difficult decision. They came out of Walmart because they knew that it wasn't actually enabling them to create the premium price position that they wanted to or the premium perception position that they wanted to. So sometimes you have to make difficult decisions. Mm. Now, you know, it's a very, diff very different world selling flat screen televisions and mobile phones from selling uh, beverages in, in multiple CTNs in, in virtually sure. every country in the world. But at the end of the day, you know, every brand should be seeking to make sure that the environment in which it is, is purchased and consumed reflects the values of the brand itself. And I'm sure that one of the things that the teams at Coca-Cola would be doing is trying to make sure that the, the, uh, the product isn't sitting at the bottom of mouldy fridges and indeed yeah. talking very carefully to those distributors who Fair. might be allowing that. But you'll acknowledge that does happen yeah, absolutely. though. Absolutely, and uh, you know, I think there, there are inherent challenges, it's the law of large numbers. When you have 13 million pieces of equipment, coolers, vending machines, you know, we have 987,000 vending machines in Japan. You know, can I tell you that every one of those is perfectly merchandised and clean? Probably in Japan they are, but in, in, <laughs> in, uh, in other markets probably no. And so there are but that's why, you know, Coke is one of the largest employers in the world. It's certainly the largest employer on the continent of Africa. Uh, and it uses very, very uh, different and unique distribution methods. Uh, many of them trying to employ, for example, giving entrepreneurial opportunities to women to build a business to get our product out into the marketplace. So we're, I think, getting back to your prior question, how we're going to reinvent ourselves is very much along the sustainability line in the sustainability area to make sure that we can grow and double our business but do it in a sustainable way. If we don't do that, then people are not going to buy our products. So, and this must have a lot to do with water being mm -hmm. a, totally. a key in, in, yep. ingredient in that. Now, yes. Af Africa, there's um, a, a lot of water problems. Yes, hey, there's there not, not enough water where yep. it needs to yes. be. What are you doing um, th there with regard to that and also with regard to helping local businesses? And the, 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 I'll put this in the context of when a mining company shows up sure. um, to dig a hole in the ground, they tend to build roads. Um, and in a lot of places in Africa, that is... Yep. Um, an absolute innovation. When they leave, they leave the roads behind. When you go there, what are you doing sure. in addition to selling some bottles of Coke? Yeah, great question. I think fundamentally we believe that unless you have a stable society uh, and, and a, society, a functioning society, you're not going to have a business, right? And so as a consequence, we've made very specific commitments to NGOs uh, in, in, uh, in the instance of water, with, uh, World, with World Wildlife Fund that we will put back and deliver as much water as we consume. And we'll reach that goal by, I believe it's 2015 or 2016. Mm -hmm. So basically, water neutrality. What we take out, we'll put back in. In addition, we've got, I would say, literally 250 projects around the world in water-stressed areas, particularly Africa, India would be another example, mm -hmm. where we actively work to revive an aquifer if it's not live, to help drill the wells and ensure that we are becoming, that we are fully responsible members of the community. If we're not doing that, then we're not going to survive as a business. Because we believe fundamentally you can do well by doing good. And, uh, uh, and so that, that is something that's a very strong thread for us. In addition, we've got a very aggressive program we call 5 by 20. 5 million women entrepreneurs by 2020. So helping set them up in businesses helping and stimulate, and we've partnered a lot with Clinton Global Initiative on this, helping the women get involved in businesses, giving them the start, the seed capital, for them to start their own business, because ultimately that becomes the future of a stable community, is if you can get people to build a business. It doesn't need to be ours, but we just, that happens to be where we are. And what countries are you doing, what countries are you doing that in? Very aggressive in that, in Africa particularly, and in Africa, yeah. And now we've also gone into some very interesting farming ventures with with NGOs uh, like Howie Buffett, with Bill and Linda Gates Foundation, where we'll partner with them and a country in order to, let's say, you know, Kenya and Uganda are two examples where countries where we're getting really developed juice businesses. But there's not, a, there's not local fruit, indigenous fruit, that's being produced at a level that can support and supply enough for the juice demand. 
So we're working, we've got a program now to work with 70,000 farmers in Kenya and Uganda, specifically, and you say, my God, how big is their farm the size of this table? It might, it might be two mango trees, regardless of what it is. Hmm. How do you get them commercially focused to produce a product that then can be used and complete this whole chain, and the, ultimately the fruit is then used as the juice, the juice goes to the markets. It's an entire circle of sustainability. Those are very aggressive projects, and I would, I would lay down what Coke is doing in the sustainability area against any company in the world. It's vast. Uh, and we, even in Africa, have spent tens of millions of dollars on AIDS, HIV, AIDS education, condom distribution through our, through our trucks, et cetera. All of these things that we want to be a responsible global citizen. And, and, and a big part of that is putting in your, on your global supply chain. Yeah. Um, global supply chains, is that something that a lot of um, companies f forget about when they start um, with a new product? They forget about it. We saw how um, sensitive the world um, of electronics was when we had the quake and the tsunami in Japan. It disrupted a lot of things. Do you see companies um, bringing their production close to where they're going to sell it in the future um, as part of a marketing strategy simply because those chains were getting so long? Um, I th I th yeah, I mean, again, I think to a degree it depends on which sector you're looking at. So mm. certain sectors you might see some of these. Uh, these trends uh, and in others it makes more sense to have large regional distribution it really does depend on the nature of your product and the nature of the markets you're serving and, and the degree to which there is change in the product by the time it actually reach the, reaches the users in market um, I guess there's a couple of points here one of which is to do with the speed of innovation um, the change in the way that the markets operate around businesses now and when I say markets I'm talking about us consumers mm. we are so joined up now uh, and as an individual, we now have the power to hold whole companies to account. And we've seen that several times over the last uh, decade, and particularly as social network has increased in, in capability, you've seen companies literally being held to account by consumers. Now, this changes the relative relationship between companies and markets. Um, and also, uh, going along with that, is an increase in the wave of, shall we say, demand from what people want and what they expect from companies. Uh, I think one of the things that's going to force companies to look at their supply chains is quite simply they're going to have to move a lot faster to actually meet the needs of markets. Now, one of the big problems with most companies is that they're still built around structures that were created in the Industrial Revolution or the creation of you know, mass production, top-down management, silo mentalities, disconnection between one department and another, very difficult to get anything to change, whereas markets are now moving very, See, very quickly. It's registering with everyone in the room, that, that corporate structure. Absolutely, yeah, I mean, we all live with these in, within these structures, and yet in order to be successful mm. now, you need to be able to operate across that. So you need horizontal management decision making, not vertical management decision making. So, you know, regardless of supply chain, I think that's one of the biggest issues that companies have to deal with. And going along with that, you need to be able to get to market fast. That needs to, means you need the production in the right mm -hmm. place, the materials in the right place at the right time, and the right length of supply chain in order to meet it. Big, big issues going forward. Sorry big to issues. interrupt, okay. but we need to take questions from the audience now. Great. Okay, who's got a question? <clears throat> Don't be shy. Oh, there we go. Chap of the beard. Yes, I do need to exercise um, the, uh, more. You're right. Uh, my question is, how are you talking about building a brand uh, during the last NCAA men's basketball tournament? We saw Powerade on the sidelines. Right. Um, Tell us a little bit about the, you know, how that's coming along with uh, Coca-Cola. Yeah, well, uh, well, of course we own Powerade, uh, and we thought that that was, uh, previously we'd had uh, vitamin water there, and, and we thought strategically when we thought about the space that Powerade needed to occupy, we thought it, it made much more sense from a strategic alignment of the brand with the event to put Powerade on the sidelines of NCAA as opposed to vitamin water, which we look at more of a lifestyle type beverage. Um, and very focused on Powerade, what we would call points of sweat. And uh, that whole basketball tournament is a big point of sweat. So uh, you know you want to be there. And, and it was a nice platform for us. And uh, we also, for the first time this past year, uh, in 2010, during the World Cup broadcast of South Africa, we gave about 25% of our perimeter signage to Powerade also. 
because we thought that the pe you know we, we we really wanted to align the brand with the actual event, and we'll do also the same thing for the Olympics next year. There you go. Heard it here first. Um, next person, Matt. Yeah, question Come over on. here. Uh, this is for Joe. Uh, Pepsi and Coke have been formidable competitors all over the world, yes. but particularly here in the U.S. Yes. over the last years. And in the mid '90s, Coke was really cranking away, mm -hmm. and then in the early 2000s, Pepsi had a renewed yes. kind of lead in the battle. Recently, Coke has made a ton of inroads, so I was just curious, what do you feel that were the key things Coke did right to do so much better in the last few years in the U.S.? Uh, I think uh, it lost its arrogance. Uh, I think that uh, I would say uh, a, down, you know, a major uh, sin of any company is believing its own BS and press clippings. And I think Coke probably went through that period where it got a little inflated uh, and, uh, uh, and engaged in excessive hubris. And so I think that what uh, that period of uh, downturn by Coke had about seven to 10 years ago has brought more humility and made the company uh, very humble and hungry. Um, it also, I think, in some instances, lost belief on its core business. And I think that the thing that uh, Neville Isdell did as the previous CEO and now Mutar Kent as, as my boss and the current CEO is, has restored the belief in our core business as a business driver. So our view is that we have to be successful in sparkling beverages, even in the United States market, before we can be successful in anything else. And so um, um, you know, I think it, it all got back to focusing more. Focus can be a strategy. And focus can give you advantage. And by focusing on sparkling beverages, that's kind of, uh, uh, I think, significantly helped us get our mojo back. But uh, we remain very humble and hungry and believe the best is yet to come, even in North America. I'm hoping the lady down here has a question for Jess. It's a question for Joe also. Yeah. OK. Sorry, uh, sorry, Jess. That's all right. Uh, I noticed that you were talking about extrinsic and intrinsic yeah. messaging. and the memories and the movie theaters and the raisinets and popcorn, all this. And um, I also noticed that you talked about a little moment of happiness yeah. and refreshment in your life. And then you picked up that bottle of Coke and yes. took a sip and went, ah. Yeah. So I just wonder, are you trying to subliminally message us? <laughs> <laughs> well, you would know that there's none of that that occurs in advertising, of course. You know that. <laughs> so uh, the real question is. <laughs> 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 it's a great observation, though. And it's really you get the skateboard. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed. So, I, well, I did get those memories kick up when you did that. So the real question is: uh, there's a movement toward organic and natural and mm -hmm. no chemical, and and there's Coke Zero for no caffeine, and there's, you know, before that there was no sugar, so there was Diet Coke, mm -hmm. and now there are, forgive me, all the brands that you have on the juice side and the bottled water and flavored mm -hmm. seltzer on shore side. So does it balance? Um, have you projected it out to the point where you figure that you know what Coke, what Coke is losing, Coke Zero, uh, Coke, Diet Coke picked up, and Coke Zero picked up, and now the juice brands are picking up, and you know, it's all synergistic that way? That's a great question. I think you know, obviously the challenge is the law of large numbers, which is when you have a business. Last year, uh, we ended the year at 25 and a half billion cases. And we grew 1.1 billion cases. So uh, that was 5% growth for us. 5% you know, growth on a base that large, you know, it's, very, it's very good. It's very, actually, our communication, our, our bandwidth to the street is 3 to 4%. So we over-delivered on that growth. I, I think that we're trying to manage a portfolio. You know, and um, uh, I think you know, we need to move from brand management to more aggressive portfolio management. And, and I would say that uh, while Coke is a world-class sparkling beverage company, at all levels, from manufacturing, distribution, and marketing, we probably have a lot to learn in some of those other categories. When you get into non-alcoholic ready-to-drink beverages, we could literally be competing in 13 different categories. And I tell everybody all the time, we can do anything we want to do, but we can't do everything. And so it's really important to focus, prioritize. And so we have our, our, our priorities and kind of that axis of countries, categories, and brands that we're looking to drive and, and we think we'll deliver the greatest economic value. Now, that gets 80% of your resource. You want the other 20% other to get new things, do different things, launch new products, always testing, learning, failing, learning, whatever. But we don't, we're managing that portfolio, and our thing is all about choice. 
we get, a, you know, if somebody wants a Coke, great. If they want a Diet Coke, great. If they want a juice, great. If they want a tea, great, whatever. We want to be there, for, we want to be the total, total opportunity for any kind of hydration. That's our strategy. This is for Jez. Oh, thank you. See, I know. It's happened for I was you. beginning to feel like thank you. Cinderella here. Yeah. Well, that's because Coca Cola kind of has written a book on global branding. But, um, you know, Google, Apple, Microsoft in the last number of years have all turned the corner to where the majority of their revenues are coming from outside of the U.S. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that branding and what might have worked in terms of the formula, you know, 20, 30 years ago is radically different when you're talking about having to address 50 different cultures, maybe 30 different languages. So I'd like to get your sense on what's changed in terms of making a global brand successful, given that some of these big U.S. companies are really more international than they are U.S.-centric? Um, first of all, I, I referenced the fact that uh, three weeks ago we were in China and we released um, a list of the top brands in China. And uh, we were asked a number of questions about you know, whether or not any of them would qualify for best global brands. And we said, well, actually, in terms of revenue and size and value of the brands, the businesses are certainly big enough. Uh, in fact, I think the, uh, the top brand there, uh, China, um, uh, uh, would have been a top 10 brand in the main list. And I think the top 10 brands in the whole list would have been in best global brands. So they've certainly got the, the scale. What they don't have is they don't have the understanding of how to operate in complex markets. And it's very easy to say that all we've got to do then is internationalize and just go and sell everywhere. Because it is just not that simple. And it is getting harder and harder. I think a lot of uh, brands and companies during the si uh, 60s and 70s specialized in just taking everything everywhere and doing the same thing, identical. In, in many different markets. And that worked for a little while, but actually now as consumers, we're a little bit more discerning. So, you know, big companies that have failed to get it right in China because they haven't understood Chinese consumers. You know, so having uh, grocery stores that are selling fresh food, well, as far as Chinese consumers are concerned, it's not fresh unless it's still running around or swimming or whatever it <laughs> normally does. And this creates huge issues, a lack of understanding of consumers. I think that's the fundamental thing that is the challenge, is, is understanding people, particularly in a world where we are becoming more demanding uh, and we expect much more. And we are taught constantly across different categories about what to expect in terms of product service, in terms of um, you know, service delivery, in terms of experiences. And we happily take these things across categories. So what we might learn in the, uh, in the hotel industry, we then happily uh, lay overlay across the airline industry and then become d deeply dissatisfied when we don't receive it. So these kinds of things, are they are huge issues. And yet the number of companies that we work with who still benchmark themselves on their direct competitors and don't seem to recognize the fact that their customers or consumers might just be shopping in different experiences somewhere else and therefore are transferring those expectations. I think that's a huge issue. I think the second thing comes back to that thing I mentioned earlier on about the fact that markets are changing shape uh, and the demands upon uh, companies are increasing significantly. And the very structure of many organizations is going to get in the way. And until companies start to challenge that, they will continue to see themselves overtaken by the likes of the Googles, etc. And look at them and say, I'm not quite sure what it is they're doing and how they're managing that. Well, they're actually fundamentally different in the way that they run themselves, the way that they look at the delegation of responsibility, the way empowerment works, the way leadership works, the way decisions are taken, the ability to connect across all of those different departments. These things which will, I believe, will be the things that really mark out the successful brands in the future. Mm. Yes, you have to understand your consumer. Yes, you need to understand what you stand for as a brand and be able to deliver that in a localized way without disturbing the heart of what you might be about. But some of these bigger operational issues um, are going to be the things that trip people up in the next five or ten years. This will be our final question. Okay, who's, who's got the mic? Someone's got the... Uh... There we go. Gentleman here. Uh, question for Jez. Um, I guess you it all worked out even in the end. It did. It did. It did. <laughs> it did. That's yes, great. I did it on purpose. Um, I guess you could say that you know, in American brands have had sort of more currency than brands of other countries around the world. Mm -hmm. Is, in your perception, is that true? And if so, what's the driver of that? And is that, is that continuing or is that changing? Um, I suppose in one word, I'd say history. 
I think the Americans understood, or many American businesses understood the opportunity of global markets maybe a little sooner than some other people. Um, I do, however, think that history doesn't necessarily dictate the future. Um, and certainly some of the businesses that we look at in, in countries like China, uh, in countries like India, in countries like Brazil, you know, there are some very, very smart businesses around the world who are set to give each other a run, let alone the, uh, the US, um, shall we say, incumbents. So I think, you know, whilst we see, I think something like 52 or 53 out of the top 100 are, are American businesses, every year we start to see more and more businesses coming in from different parts of the world. You know, this year we see Nissan come in, another Japanese business. We see HTC come in from Taiwan. It's very, very good to see John Deere come in from the US. But, you know, on that basis, that's two to one. So I think, you know, we will see a gradual change in the landscape over the next 15, 20, 30 years. Um, and it, you know, it will, I'm sure a lot of it will come from those brick markets that we all talk about all the time in meetings. Great stuff. Thank you very thank much. You. Jess Frampton, Joe Tripodi, thank, thank you. you very much. I'm Simon Constable. Please join me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very nice. Thank you very much. Very nice. <laughs>